Uh, the guy who hosted it, um, Axeman, that's his nickname. Uh, he's he he let the other guy get off, and then he just introduced me. He's like, "All right, now we have my buddy coming up next. His name is Jordan. He's gonna tell you some funny stories." And I'm like, "What?" And he's just like, "Yeah, come up here, man. Like, just tell him the story that you told me earlier, and they'll they'll, th- they'll think it's funny." And that is secret number one to comedy. Welcome back for the third time, Knox. Oh, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Oh, that looks good. Come on in. Can I get one? He died and then he went to the castle. Like, don't you wear a great leg. They should this. Yeah, play ball. It could be yours. Just happy. Fucking dope. Where's the I'm fast as fuck boy? What's that from? Fast as fuck boy. Um, I think it was like a narration of uh, like a guy like looking at his dog or whatever, like narrating his dog. I think so. Or the that sounds was, that sounds right to me. Or who knows? Like that could have been the uh, like the first popular like edit to it. Yeah, you know, like where that someone clipped that and then put that audio over right, right. that. You guys, you guys heard about the uh, the mystery of uh, the uh, record scratch? Like, yeah, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here. <laughs> like those. Like, have you have you ever heard that clip? Or like seeing that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was driving people crazy. They're like, "What movie was that from? What TV show was that from? Like, what is that from? Where did it start? Where did it start?" Mm -hmm. And it was actually from like a like a YouTube video from like seven years ago that someone clipped that, and then they made their own rendition of it, and then put it on one of their videos. So there is no like actual source. Like it was never from something, but they're like, you've heard it so many times. Yeah. I thought Um, it was from a movie. Exactly. That's what I would have guessed. Yeah. And now there has been, you know, movies that have copycat of that. Yeah. So what'd you say it's most popular from? (sighs) I'm trying to think. Like movie wise, I know that you I can have, probably hear like I hear Ryan Reynolds saying it for some reason. Yeah, like a Deadpool. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably it. Actually, now yeah. that I'm thinking about it. Yep. So weird the colloquialisms that just become popular, the weird phrases that stick in people's brains. Yep. It's like fucking xanthan gum. <laughs> xanthan gum. Yeah. Go xanthan, ahead and explain that one. Xanthan gum is actually just like a like a powder and stuff that you add to. I'm trying to think of like what you would add it to, it, it, like, like actual candy? gum, right? Like candy? Yeah, I feel like it actually like I think like, it's actually like hardened stuff. Shit. Yeah, trident layers. That's a great gum. That's a great that's gum, a great and that's gum. a brain sticker, dude. Yeah, I feel for like sure. That's got to be in like my top most memorable, memorable top hundred most memorable ads. Mm-hmm. The, can I get paid in Trident Layers? Yep. Everybody fucking remembers that. Yeah. yeah. I um underrated candy that got discontinued RIP, but it's the um it's the Altoids mm. that were like that grapefruit flavor or whatever, and they came like in that kind of oh. like colored can, like that colored tin. But and the mangoes? Yes. Yeah, yes. Are or tangerine ones. Like those, like those were discontinued. Now you just have your straightforward. Piece of shit Altoids. They don't make flavored Altoids anymore? No, yeah, go look. Up. Yeah, they discontinued them. Like, my favorite one. I remember being, like, in fifth grade during, like, Christmas vacation and stuff. Like, and I was eating just, them till my tongue would rip yeah. type shit. Yeah. Like, we'd go to... Your tongue uh, would rip? Yeah. If yeah. you just keep eating them and, like, you know, just, like, basically just rubbing your tongue on it, mm-hmm. it'll rip, dude. It's dude, sour Skittles. Like, um, you guys know who... Uh, oh, man, I can see his face. Um, the competitive eater. Um, Asian guy. Oh shit! The hot dog eater. Yes. Damn it! He's a YouTube channel. You Matt Stoney. His... Matt Stoney. He did a uh, a gummy bear or no Sour Patch Kids, and he ate like a thousand Sour Patch Kids. And by like his sixth handful, you just see his tongue just bleeding because oh. it's just tearing it apart. Oh. Like it's like any like any candy like that. It just it like makes your taste bud swell and just like explode basically i'm like fuck man that's hardcore what a man that man. is hardcore that's like yeah. 24 blazing wings in two that's minutes that's where you that's hey you know <laughs> he uh he hates spicy food so i think i still have that record on for sure <laughs> um but no man good candy it's kind of hard to beat yeah what else we it got is gum? dude it's, yeah. it's- <laughs> 
Welcome Good to the gum. gum cast. Do you guys remember when um, Five Gum first came out? Yeah. Five Gum stimulate your senses. Remember the early yeah. commercials? Yeah. yeah, it was just like a, like it was like a truth or dare kind of like thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, and yeah, those commercials were like super over like, the top. Yeah, it was just like uh, like. Uh, Take off your clothes and like Stimulate go jump in the pool senses. or something. Yeah, like that. Like they're like, selling Molly or something. Yeah. Like do you want. think? Do you think that people like were giving out five gum at like nursing homes, like seeing if they would do some like wild shit? <laughs> probably, you know? dude. I bet shit. <laughs> yeah. shit's probably a lot freakier at those damn nursing homes. It's like it's like, oh man, I have a good bit on that that I've been doing. Um, and uh, also, just so you guys know, I do stand up comedy. Yeah, let's, let's uh, introduce you real quick. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. welcome yeah. to the Shame Show, everybody. We're here with Jordan Reader. Jordan Reader, a man of many talents, um, a uh, grizzly, grizzly Mr. Bear Mr. HHS, man. as we found out, the Mr. Grizzly Man, yep. but yep. Blazing Wing record holder, unofficial. Unofficial, at one point. Who knows? I don't even know what the record is anymore. Saver of people from wreckage. Got, oh, wow. That was a deep cut. That, yeah. Holy shit. I was going to I was gonna ask you about that yeah. when we got started. Yeah, so um, classic classic Rockford kid, classic like Midwest kid, grew up Catholic. Um, and I would go to St. Peter's in Rockford, but I lived in Roscoe at the time. So we'd take uh, Route 2, like just going to and from Rockford to Roscoe. And yep. I was coming home from church, and there was this Corvette, like from like the '90s, like bright red, and it just passed me, going like 110 miles an hour, like on a 55. On two right there. Yeah, and this was also like the day after you know Fourth of July. Um, so I'm like, mm, that guy's having some fun. Like, uh, like I knew. It. I'm like, he's he's probably hammered, or he like needs to get somewhere fast. So. Uh, I'm just driving like another two minutes and I start seeing like a little bit of smoke ahead of me and it's that Corvette and it's flipped. It's in the ditch. How, how old were you at this time? 2019. Okay. I was probably 19. Yeah. And I like, I saw the car flipped over and there was already one car pulled over and uh, a guy, uh, like one of the guys was like crawling out from like the, like his broken mirror or his broken uh, window and I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, are you like, are you OK? He goes, yeah, man, I'm good. I'm good. He goes, my buddy probably ain't. And I'm like, what? And I like looked in there and his buddy is just like hanging upside down. Like I'm buddy being Hold passenger. On. Say, the say, say, it, passenger. say it one more time. What? So what happened? The car like it, it, it went off the road. It went off the road, hit a ditch. I don't know if they hit like a rock or like a log or something like that, but it caused the, it over. caused the roll so it didn't look like it rolled like a whole bunch of times but it looked like it just rolled and then stayed on its top like mm. going into the ditch not a good spot and to the, be with the vet the driver got out and the driver got out and i thought it was just him and turns out nope his buddy who's in the passenger seat was still in there so i went to his side tried to open up his door not not budging so i went underneath and i cut his seat belt uh, because it was a Boy Scout, still have a pocket knife on me. Um, not today. And I'm watchless, too. I'm a fucking piece of shit today. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I cut his seatbelt. He fell. And then he woke up when he fell, like when he fell down. And uh, I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, you've been in a bad car accident. And I need to get you out of this car. I'm like, it's smoking. And I don't know, like, what's going to happen. So he's just like, okay. But there was so much broken glass on, like, now in the car from, like, where that guy crawled out of. Um, where I went back to my car, always have like a blanket in the back of my car because Midwest problems. You have like that winter survival kit, you know, yeah. like, you know, those, you know, some jumper cables, blanket, maybe some water in there, some beef jerky, yeah. you know, cat litter. Some, yeah, cat litter, some non perishables, and you're set, <laughs> man. So I got some blankets, some Chef Boyardee, brought that over, <laughs> and uh, I put it, I put the blanket inside the cabin. And then I had him like kind of like shimmy his way onto it, and I dragged the blanket out. And by this point, so you dragged like, him out of the driver's side. Dragged him out of the driver's side window. So it was and it was in a Corvette. So like their windows are only like you know yay big. So like you had to kind of crawl in there to like get in. But I got him on the blanket and I pulled him out. And by that point, there were like you know ten other cars around me, and people were just like standing. And like looking extremely unhelpful yeah um one lady just like had her phone out like nobody asked one of them had their phone out recording shit of course straight up of course and this is pre tick i'm like too, is right? there i'm like is is anybody like a nurse or like a doctor or something and one lady's like yeah i am it was the person recording 
There's a person recording on their phone. She Are was you the nurse. Fucking kidding Dude, me, bro. Straight up. If you're a nurse, like in this area, like you have basically like the education of like a gas station manager. Like, I don't know like what it is about it. Like, if they're not doing that, they're a baby daddy and they're working at a like or a baby mama working at a gas station, yeah. probably a road ranger, not even a good one, not even a Kelly's market. Yep. Don't want to get into the details. One but, of the sluttiest professions. Oh, for nurses sure. and teachers. With the call out. Yeah. With the justified call. Out. Yeah, I'm dude, like, you're a that's CNA, been my you're 42 years lately, old. Man. Like, you know, like, call Do something out. fucking decent when you got an opportunity like that, man. Yeah. I'm yeah, like, I'm a nurse. I'm going to sit here and fucking record. I'm like, I got my first aid merit badge five years ago when I was, like, you know, in eighth grade. And I'm like, and I'm just, like, pulling someone out of, like, a car that's smoking. I'm like, did anyone call 911 yet? And then finally someone, like, yeah, I just got off the phone now. Like, and uh, that how long, person. How long was it that you started helping and that dude called 911, you think? Or, like, when did, you know what? Uh, probably, like, how long were they gawking before they called 911? Was you it know, a decent minute or, like. Oh, it was probably, like, three minutes easy. Okay, that's know? too fucking long. It it's is. It's not, like, ridiculous. And then the one guy, long. the driver was just chilling and just, like, scratching, like, the back of his head. Yeah, was he, that, was that was he my favorite up part. or anything? Yeah, he was fine. Like he just had like a like a little bit of blood like on like on like at a shoulder area, but then it turns out it wasn't even his. You know? It was his buddies. It was his buddies. So and I, he, he and was I, inebriated, could you tell? Inebriated for sure. Inebriated for sure. And um both so, of them? Yeah, but when I cut when I pulled the other guy out, I saw that his arm was actually like twisted. So his shoulder had dislocated and his arm had spun. So like his arm like went around twice. And uh, a small piece of his bone was, like, sticking out. Mm. So, saw that in order to, like, reduce shock in people. Like, if they have something wrong with them, immediately cover them up. So, I got that guy out with the blanket, took the blanket out from underneath of them, put it over them, and then classic, like, whatever you prefer, toe-to-head inspection or head-to-toe. So, <laughs> check their head, shoulders, arms, everything like that. I knew about his arm. Um, so I didn't touch it. And you but guys everything. were away from the wreckage at this point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, probably, like, 20, 30 feet or so. Um, so a good distance. Uh, the car was still, like, smoking. It wasn't, like, I smelt gas, like, when I was in the cab. So I'm just, like, mm, don't want that to fucking blow. Um, shout out to the uh, Harlem Roscoe Fire Department for coming in at a good time and, like, uh, dealing with that. And then also helping that guy out. Um, but yeah, they just took my, like, they took my story and then you were saying is the driver kind of slunk away. Didn't he just disappear or some shit? So he was trying to just like walk, uh, like he started like walking away. You think he's so like, as soon as like the cops and like fire department showed up, he just started like walking down and stuff and uh super sketch and then the cops are like was this guy driving so i'm I'm like no that guy was (laughs) and he was like oh shit and then he started started walking a little bit faster uh yeah so they got just walking down too yeah but uh yeah it was kind of like a realization moment of uh like like not fight or flight it's like are you willing to do something like even though like i'm not the most qualified to person to do that but i'm the one who was like willing to do something in the moment yeah it's like you're right. the one out of 10 people yep <sighs> but yeah. that's I mean, a big part of life man like you said is taking initiative and, and seeing something that needs to be taken care of and and just fucking doing it man yep you can sit there and record on your phone all you want mm-hmm. and and gawk but when shit hits the fan what the fuck are you gonna do yep that's i mean yeah that's that's the the meaning of life i think is just like when it's wow now i'm getting so fucking like intimate but for real like it's like the meaning of life i think is like doing the hard thing like at the right time you know not doing you know the hard thing at the wrong time but you know if you know if it involves effort and you avoid it then it's like it's not the way to go about your life you know right be afraid of you know Mm -hmm. it's hardly ever worth leaving a challenge without at least attempting it Mm -hmm. you know take Mm -hmm. take all of your 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 challenges whatever is presented before you and and learn from it regardless of its outcome yeah and um you know at least you can say you tried in the end you know like if that guy i was really worried that like because he he wasn't like falling out of the seat like in like in a good fashion like i thought his legs were actually like stuck like underneath the dash so like when i cut him out i was just like 
he's just like my foot stuck my foot stuck. i'm like all right so i just reached up there and unhinged him he was just like underneath the glove compartment but i was like oh fuck like i didn't know if i was gonna pull his leg out and if he was gonna have his foot still like i was just like for real yeah you don't know what you're walking into on that at all yep so that's yeah so that was that was an experience i don't know what i would do to be honest you know i like to think of myself as a helpful person someone who would jump to action but i don't know if i would be crawling in there pulling dude out i think oh, i left my pocket knife at home i'm sorry but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it's also like maybe i wouldn't have done anything if like because you have to like have situational awareness too so you know if that guy was in there and he was like flipped and stuff it's okay to be you know upside down for a couple minutes you know unless you're upside down for an hour then that can like fucking put so much blood to your brain you know right but, like um, maybe you could have called 911 or something exactly taken a or you know mm-hmm. but so I, but, I don't think i would have i wouldn't have done nothing i i would have at least called 911 mm-hmm. and taken a closer look to see what's going on you know and and maybe i it depends you know maybe if it was you just smoking i would have yeah hey it depends if yeah. i don't like that person you bet your ass i'm recording yeah i'm recording to make <laughs> oh, sure that everyone's bag. statements line up you know it's just like <laughs> I, was, I was the surveillance camera it's perfectly yeah. legal yeah but perfectly. i don't like yeah depending on the situation like you have to look at like you have to be smart too because like in something like that rule number one is that make sure that whatever you're doing doesn't get you in a bad situation always watch out for yourself first yeah that's how you get your shit slipped you know if for i sure. if if you got something that is you're not supposed to be doing yet mm-hmm. of course that's not your time to be fucking mm-hmm. and it's like it's time of the essence too so because his car was smoking and i smell gas i'm just like he's alive like and this could blow up i don't know yeah. so like let's get him out of there or you know the fumes could also you know, cause him to have like brain damage and shit like that too. So I just wanted to get him out of there. Yeah, imagine also, like walking away from that and then watching that shit blow. Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like fucking bad boys too moment, man. It's just like, oh, see that that's worse. <sighs> I got a great friend. Snapchat though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> I'm be fucking famous. 120 people saw it. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm Facebook Live, just like yeah, that shit was crazy, guys. Flipped over, boom. Oh! <laughs> well, <laughs> you guys see that? <laughs> Oh, like a, that was awesome. Have like a Jake Paul moment and just get super famous super quick. Yeah. Man, I haven't met those guys. Yeah, really. so so on to maybe some lighter topics, man. What so break it down. What's going like, on and uh Yeah. Well, just tell us a little bit about comedy stuff. For sure. You're going to tell us the secret to it earlier, but oh I'll yeah, should rebuild up to it. Uh, like not like a secret, but it's not, like yeah, but kind of a secret in the terms of like I've been doing comedy only for three years. So December 18th of 2018, yeah, was my first time doing stand up, and I did that in a speakeasy, um, like a speakeasy night um, at a liquor store. So Little Italy, Chicago. Um, Gentiles, shout out Gentiles, um, shout out Axeman. Um, the that was like a great place. It wasn't even. It was like a bottle shop, not even a liquor store. And in the basement, they used to do open mics and like jam band stuff. So, like old ass wine cellar of a building that's you know 110 years old. Um, like if I stood up, like I'd hit my head on the ceiling, kind of thing. Oh, but what they do is they'd have like folding chairs and tables, and people would just be drinking and smoking, and having a good time. Um, and I was one of two comics that ended up going up that night. So the I wasn't even planning on going up either. You know, I had just been really into stand up like my entire life. Never thought I would do it, but people like um, excuse me, people like uh, like my buddy Jake. Lavoy, good guy also super he got me into podcasts and stuff like that so um like i was always interested in comics so i heard that someone was going to do live comedy there that night so i'm like i'll go stop by uh the guy who hosted it um axe man that's his nickname uh he's he he let the other guy get off and then he just introduced me he's like all right and now we have my buddy coming up next his name is jordan he's gonna tell you some funny stories and i'm like what and he's just like yeah, come up here man like just tell them the story that you told me earlier and they'll, they'll, th- they'll think it's funny and that is secret number one to comedy is that it, there's a difference between being a stand-up and then also being like the funny guy in the group and i had to learn that real quick mm. because i was the funny guy in the group but realizing that that does not translate over to you know to to stand up so 
I had to learn that real quick because, you know, when you're with your buds and stuff, and you're just shooting the shit, you guys are able to play off of, like, you get to play off your buds and oh, stuff yeah. like that. Um, it's like you, you're just riffing off of yourself, you know, maybe like some crowd work stuff here and there. Um, but don't do crowd work stuff at an open mic either, you know, unless you're absolutely bombing, like, unless you're absolutely eating dog shit, like, don't try to start going after some of the crowd because nine times out of 10, it doesn't work. Um, that one time you strike gold, it's just like, all right. It's like, that's your unicorn. Like now try again some other time. But, um, so I live in Austin, Texas. Now I moved there for comedy, like to pursue stand up, because like here, like in Northern Illinois, Wisconsin, stuff like that, um, Chicago shut down, you know, during COVID. So all the comedy stuff was pretty much just there for the gatekeepers, like the people that have been doing it for 10 years, um, and like doing it consistently. So they were they got the guaranteed stuff and then all the open micers that were just getting started, they were losing out on opportunity. So I was just like, that sucks. And I was just about to start going to a place called Coles, which is where people like, um, like Pete Holmes and like, uh, I was gonna say Amy Schumer. She definitely did it before, but, uh, like comics like that, like Coles was like King of the underground comedy scene in Chicago. Um, so I was going to plan on doing those, but ended up not. So, during COVID, I just got down to writing and trying just to make myself like the best joke, like joke teller that I could, because yeah, 90% of what I wrote, I, I can't even use because the world kind of is different from where we started. Um, and I think it's also kind of not lazy, but like, I think everyone's tired of COVID shit. So like your COVID jokes, like they just don't hit, they just don't hit and that bums everyone like, out. When I like, hear one now, I'm like, Pfft. yeah, it's like a like it's a stink they've man. exasperated all the funny out of it yeah and then some mm -hmm. so yeah so i moved to austin to kind of take advantage of the opportunity to go up as much as possible because like i could probably go up like five times six times a month great place to perform down yeah there it's anything yeah so like here i was like during the pandemic i could go up five to six times a month like go and do mics maybe do a show but that didn't happen um so when I moved to Austin, you can go up five to six times a night if you wanted to and do that Sunday through Saturday, like no problems getting up. Um, so where and when was your first time? Was like of doing stand up yeah. was was in that cellar years. was in that cellar. And that was Chicago. That was in Chicago on Taylor Street and Racine with a pretty um, private crowd, right? Pretty private. It was in front of probably about 35 people. Um, and, and you said you did pretty good. I, I fucking killed it. Like I, did, I ended up doing 15 minutes and now you're lucky to do 15 minutes anywhere, like for like an open mic. So I, I just, I just got that high and I was just like, Oh, I want to, I want to keep doing this. Mm. But the problem is I did it. And then that was all the jokes that I had. Like I just told those two <laughs> oh, funny stories. That's all the jokes. Yeah. That's all I got. And then I did another mic. And a lot of the same people that were at that mic were at this one. Oh, that has to be. So I was just about to do my same material in front of people that had already heard it. So I did. And I did okay. Like, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that story that you told. And then I did it the third time. Same people. Same place. Um, I did the same stuff. And I bombed. I ate dog shit. And uh, <laughs> it was really not good. <laughs> it was really not good. And I learned then and there, I was like, mm, I got to write. Like, I, I got to do better. Yeah. But something I was talking about with you guys earlier is like imposter syndrome. Like feeling like that you're not a comic, you know, like not feeling um, like you just feel like you're impersonating your favorite comic. And a lot of people say for the first five years, you are just mimicking your favorite comic. Um, like even when I was first starting, like I was trying to do dark shit. Like I enjoy dark comedy. So like a lot of mine felt like it was coming off like Anthony Jeselnik. Um, who else? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Jim Norton, like guys like that. And I, it just didn't feel right for me, you know? Yeah. So definitely I took 14 months off of comedy. Like I only was doing it for probably about seven months and then the pandemic hit. And then I just, yeah, I, I stopped. Um, I was also going to college at the time when I was doing comedy too. So I was only doing it like once or twice a month, maybe, you know, but it wasn't my priority. I was also dating someone and it just, yeah, wasn't high up on my list. I didn't even tell her about it. Like when I was doing comedy, I didn't tell any of my friends. 
Like I just kept it secret. I told one person that was Jake Lavoy. I'm like, hey man, I just did a mic and it was awesome. Like it felt good. It was so good. Like I'm I'm gonna keep doing this. And then the pandemic hit and it really just like put everything into perspective. Like this is something like because I was going to school for physical therapy and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. But if I was to do one thing, like this is one thing that has brought me joy, that's challenged me in a way that I like it, like where it's like healthy, but also unhealthy, you know, like, cause it's also one of the few arts where you need to be like in person to like experience, to know if you're good or not too. um, music kind of similar in a way too. Um, but with musicians, obviously you keep playing the hits and people like your hits and they don't want to hear any of your new shit. And then with comics, it's like the opposite. Um, I that's think Rogan and uh, whoever he had on was saying it was, um, like there's no faking it. It's like fighting. Mm -hmm. Or either works or it doesn't. Yeah. And um, making it work. Like you have to keep practicing it too. Because, or you have to get a new angle on it. Because something that you think could be funny, you bring up to someone, uh, you know, you you perform that and it fucking eats shit. It's, it's up to you. It's like, do you want to scrap it? Or do you feel like there's still hope for that? Like, do you think there's like new hope for, or still hope for that bit? Um, and that's definitely the hardest thing is like, you're working so hard on a bit and you're doing the different angles and, sh and shit like that. And it's like, when is it time to give up on it? So do you think it's easier or harder to do it in front of your friends? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, like it's hard, um, to like do stuff. Like, I don't know if like, I want to tell jokes like in front of my mom and dad that I would tell to my friends, you know, mm, like right. that's like a different relationship that you have. And you have to kind of get over that fear of like, I'm about to start making pussy jokes. So, yeah. and my mom and my yeah. dad are right there. So, so you really got to stop giving a fuck at a certain point. Exactly. To really, to really tap in and mm -hmm. be true to yourself. And I mean, I find that to be pretty applicable. Yeah. And um, I mean, I've like, uh, I had the opportunity this year to do um, my first headline show. Um, which was amazing. Uh, shout out Taco Betty's, which doesn't even really exist anymore. Yeah. Um, the old rooftop. Yep. The old rooftop. And that was awesome. Um, had about dude could not fit any more people up on that roof. Um, I believe that. Yeah. Like there's expected like a capacity of like 45 and we ended up getting it probably up to 65. So take that fire department. Yeah. It was like people were sitting, but they were also standing and like, you know, people were up on the stairs and like, and stuff, just kind of like looking at people's shins and shoes and stuff. <laughs> Not, didn't even get to see me, but I ended up doing uh, about 40 minutes. I was supposed to do 30, but then I just like, ah, I'm having a good time. Like this is, it's all working and it's something I've been practicing for. Um, like it felt like a special, which is such a, it's such a bogus thing to say. Um, <laughs> like, Cause I'm just like, I'm still so new to comedy and that's something that going to Austin, like people don't want to hear. It's like, I've been doing comedy for three years, but like, again, there was a pandemic. I took time off. I wasn't doing it as often. And people say like, Oh, it's, it's been three years since my first time. That's usually what I say. Um, and I think people like Younger comics like that I've met in Austin that they've all moved there for comedy. Like that's their sole purpose. And they're talking like, I'm like, oh, like, how was your show last night? It's like, oh, dude, I fucking crushed it. Like I murdered. I don't think you know, like what those terms like mean yet. You know, like you have an idea like like murdering is just the best you've ever done. And uh, up until that point. Hmm. But until you get, you know, and I haven't even done it. It's like until like you get like a theater or an arena or like a club and you get people like dying laughing like for your entire set. That's when you can say you murdered. And even some of the best comics right now, they would probably only say that they've murdered, you know, a handful of times in their life. But I'm like, I'm talking to open micers and they're like, oh, I've murdered, you know, 12 times this month. And I'm like, no, you haven't. <laughs> yeah. Like, stop thinking that you're the shit or trying to get like my approval or like my respect based on like what you say people thought of your show. Um, and I'm just going to say this now. Like, if you're thinking about doing stand up, do it. It's a great time. But also know that you suck and you will continue to suck until you're. 15 years in and you've put the time in and you've you put the effort in um because if you're three years into comedy and you think that you're crushing it and that you think you're great it's like you've already lost like yeah. 
it's there's definitely has to become like some humble moments in there where you're like, I don't know shit. Like I've being in Austin, you know, Rogan lives there. Uh, Tony Hinchcliffe works, lives there. Uh, Brian Redband lives there. So I've met, I haven't met Rogan yet, but I've met Tony and I've met Redband and they're really good guys. Um, I met, I met Tony on the rooftop of Vulcan um, after a, a Kill Tony show, which was very nice. Um, great time. Ended up meeting him up there. I was just up there smoking a joint with a couple of the other comics. And then Tony came up with his girlfriend and they're just like, talking at like this like picnic table area and then tony gets up to leave and he starts saying goodbye to people and then he looks at me and i like give him like the old-fashioned white guy nod like (laughs) yep and uh he walks up to me and he's like hey i'm tony i don't think we've met and i'm like hey i'm uh i'm jordan reader nice to meet you he's like yeah where are you are you a comic like where are you from and then he just starts like initiating the conversation with me and so we talked for about 10 minutes and he's just like, are you coming to the next show? Like tomorrow? I'm like, ah, you know, like I, I don't think so. Like I didn't get a ticket for it. And he goes, well, just, he goes, just go to the door guy and tell him that I invited you and you'll, you know, you'll get in for free. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what did you just say? <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, just, he goes, yeah, just go up to the door guy, say that, um, that, that I invited you and he'll give you, uh, the wristband. And I'm like, all right. Damn, I'm going to do that when I go down there. Fuck. I legit went like I legit was thinking about not going because I'm just like, there's no way that even happened. Like, this is not a thing. Like, It didn't happen. Whatever. I'm like, I'll go do a mic that night and just kind of forget about it. I'm like, that was like a fever dream I had. <laughs> and then sure as shit, I went to Vulcan. I'm like, hey, like my name is so and so. Tony invited me. And he's just like, yep, you're on the list. Uh, and then he gave me a black wristband which is a VIP wristband, which means that I could kick anybody out of their table and take their spot. What? But me being a Midwestern nice guy was like, I would never kick anyone out of their seat. Just like if I missed out, I missed out. Sorry. So I just stood and watched the shows and it was a good time. Um, Ended up meeting Tony actually in the green room, which is wild to think about. Um, But yeah, like his his agent or like his promoter was there and he's just like, Oh, you got the black wristband. Like Tony invited you. I'm like, yes, he did. And he's like, well, let's go uh, say hi to him really quick. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, you know, don't bother him. Like his show's about to start and shit like that. And I'm like, I don't want to be the open micer that is like super like over the top. Like I'm such a big fan and yeah. stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be a comic and no, don't be that. Just play it. Cool. Time, like, you know, time creates opportunities. And then with those opportunities, like, just make it organic as possible. Mm -hmm. So this agent brings me up and uh, knocks on the door and it opens up the green room door. And I forgot who the guest was that week on Kill Tony. I think it was Derek Bronson. Good guy. L.A. comic. Um, But, yeah, it was just like a group full of people. The band, Derek, Tony, Red Band and stuff. And Tony looks up and he's just smoking American spirit. He's just like, you made it hell yeah and i'm just like yeah man i'm like i appreciate you bringing me here and i'm like i'm just gonna go get a drink and i'll let you guys get back to it and he's like well before you go you gotta meet everybody and he has me shake all the band's hands and security guys and stuff like that and uh he's like well i appreciate you coming man he goes a lot of people uh you know might have thought that i was fucking with him and i'm like no i'm like trust me i'm like i, I thought for a moment you did like i thought that was all like a fucking dream i had and he's just like <laughs> you just had like a Tony has just like such a signature laugh, like, <laughs> like it's not loud or anything like that. It's just like quiet and high. Um, but no, so I just chatted with them for a couple minutes, met everybody, and then left. And his security guard was trying so adamantly to. He's like, "You do security before? Like, you want to like you want to help out around here?" And I have a job, like I work, you know. So I, like part of me moving to Austin was also like making sure that I had a job lined up to where I didn't have to work weekends or nights or anything like that just so i could do comedy and uh man ever since i got there though every club that i've been to they're just like you uh like yeah you ever do security man and i'm like "Ah, i haven't it sounds like a good in though it is honestly honestly. it is um but uh no i've enjoyed austin thoroughly um it's definitely been weird being away from the area for so long because you know i lived in chicago for about five years before covid hit and then left and then went up to austin but um no it's been good and i'm i'm glad that you're still doing well with the businesses and stuff i know that uh yeah 
things were a little shaky there during COVID and stuff. A and kind touch of, and go. A little oh, touch yeah. and go for sure. Everything was shaky mm-hmm. there for a hot minute. Yeah, when do you think Austin would get a uh, Marco's Vapor? <laughs> As we were discussing when our, earlier. When uh-huh. our government Never. pulls their head yeah. out of their asses. So yeah. let me know when that FDA. happens. Yeah. I mean, ATF, I mean... They have no problems in Texas, right? Like they never had a problem or anything like that, like back in like like nineteen nineties. Yeah, man, how are you gonna make an agency that regulates alcohol, tobacco, and firearms? Man, that's like the three coolest things. Sounds you like know? they should be working. Add in Wisconsin. marijuana in there, yeah. and it sounds like shit. Wisconsin problem to me. Like. That's just like a, a night at your cousin's, I'm just making brandy yeah. old fashions and just fucking <laughs> shooting clay pigeons in the backyard. I don't know. For real. Um, it totally the, should be called fat, by the way. Firearms, alcohol, and tobacco. I'm going to say, you call me fat, man? Like, you just bring me on the show and just start <laughs> calling me called fat? fat? It should be called fat. I thought you said you should be called fat. Like, oh, no, the ATF. It's <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, what is the biggest crowd you've um, entertained? Oh, um, definitely comedy on state in Madison. Um, probably anywhere from like two fifty to three hundred. Um, comedy on state. If you if you are in like you know northern Illinois area, even if you're in fucking Chicago, um, comedy on state in Madison is the best, like the best club like in this area. Like drive up an hour from from here and. Just go see really great comedians at a really great club. What's um, it called? Comedy on State in Madison. That's where I met Mark Norman at as well. Super cool guy. Um, yeah, great club. Great um, acoustics. You know, very low ceiling. It's in the basement. What's um, uh, What's your favorite show that you've performed at? Ooh, like part of me just personal reasons. Part of me wants to say um, headlining um, for sure. It was the most time I've ever done as a comic, you know? Um, yeah. But, man, one of my favorite times is probably the last time I did Comedy on State, which was back in October. That was a great, great, great thing. And then they also tape your sets, too. So, like, I also have, like, video and stuff that I can, you know, put out and also, like, you know, take pictures of and advertise. Um, but, yeah. Right, I, looking super legit. Yeah. And, and everything, mm-hmm. like. And it's a hot it's room too. Work. It's a hot room, which means like people know it's a comedy club. They're going to laugh. They're going to have a good time. So it also like gives you confidence. Like gives you confidence to do it. Right. You don't want to go to a comedy club with, you know, the dry ass attitude a lot of folks got. Yep. You know, go there, loosen up. Yep. I ended up seeing um, Jim Norton there, um, New York comic. He's been in the game since the early '90s, late '80s. Um, he's great. So I'm there, and they also have like a zero tolerance rule for talking, for like heckling. So like if you if you heckle or like talk, one you get one warning, but as soon as you talk again, you're out of there. The guy, this one couple, didn't even get through the opener, and they got kicked out. And Jeez. the the opener, um, uh, Tim, Tim something, Tim Smith out of Chicago, also great guy. Um, he was opening for Jim Norton, and is he a black dude? No, okay, that's I'm Owen Smith. Up. I think okay. you're thinking of. Um, but no, Tim, great guy. He was going through a set. He was telling a great joke about his dad loves the Matthew McConaughey in the movie Fool's Gold. Um, great bit. Go follow him on Instagram. Uh, and this guy just like kept like heckling, like saying like Matthew McConaughey, like. <laughs> Chicago. All right, all right. Yeah. All right. And he's just like, you're from, and then Tim's like, you're from Chicago? And he's like, Rockford. And I like fucking <laughs> slap my forehead. I'm like, no. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Like, quit giving us a bad name, dude. Like, <laughs> shit. And uh, yeah, he talked twice and him and his wife got kicked out. And they're just like, oh, yeah, we just took the trip up here. We just got done camping. And he's just like, He's just like, uh, can you do something else for me? Shut the fuck up. Like he just like legit said it, and uh, he goes, "They will kick you out. Like just be cool. Like just be chill." And then they talked again, and then yeah, they got kicked out, which I think is important because unless, like, unless the comic like wants to like do crowd work, like wants to like work off of you, like he'll ask you the question, you can respond, you can have back and forth. That's fun. That's good stuff. But when you just shout shit at the comedian. 
it's never good. One, you're distracting them, and then you're also distracting the audience, and you're like making them lose their pacing, their timing, shit like that, and just fucks up everything. Um, I had to deal with a heckler in Janesville not too long ago, and he just kept talking every like during everyone's set, and then finally he talked during mine. And that's I just, such a weird thing to do. Like I would never think to heckle comedians like outside just of up. just like yeah, yeah the it's standard like, like yeah or woohoo that yeah. was funny or usually you know something. Drunk people, but I'm it's, sure. it's usually just drunk people. Like yeah. it's it's usually drunk people. This guy was hammered and um, he was dressed like Elmer Fudd, and I just started doing Elmer Fudd impersonations. And, <laughs> um all right that's pretty funny <laughs> yeah it was uh yeah i'm like the only thing that you're hunting for is children i'm like you fucking pedophile piece of shit and i was like i just went deep down i just fucking tore that guy apart i feel bad for him but i don't nah um, dude talked, sometimes you when you put yourself in the position to be the nail guess what you get fucking nailed sometimes dog yeah it was yeah that's that's for sure um but i've no i've enjoyed my time being back um Austin definitely has more things going on every day. Um, but it's definitely been good to like slow down and like just like know why I'm doing this and like why I love it rather than just like because it's always a grind and it's always going to be a grind, but just like being able to like sit back, see how far you've come, and then just like, all right, like, dude, I can tell you've learned a shit ton since the last time we were chatting about for it for sure. Even. Like, yeah um you you got you got all the reference a, a ton of references down mm-hmm. i mean that's important i'm not super submersed in the comedy realm so i'm not familiar with uh, definitely nearly as much work as as you or marco are uh i guess i would just say i'm becoming more of a fan of it in mm-hmm. general and i think everyone just i think it's kind of like beer i think every, like a lot of people say they don't like beer a lot of people also say that they don't like stand-up um or they do but what they like is like bush light, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's just like your bush lights. Kevin like, Hart. Uh, Kevin Hart, Jeff Foxworthy, yep. Bill Enval, like stuff like that. And I love those guys. Anybody's going to think somebody's funny. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And if not, then I don't know. You, you should probably get some help, bud. Yeah. And you just got to find it. And like if all they know, you know, is bush light. And as soon as they have an IPA, they're like, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah. I would hate that. I and can't then- say I've ever heard anyone say I don't like comedy. Because if I did, I probably wouldn't talk to that person ever again. Yeah, it's and, like, and you don't like, and maybe funny? it's mm-hmm. it's more people like the canned funny, and what I mean by that is just like media, television shows, mm-hmm. whatever it is. You know, yeah. there's there's enough entertaining. You know, entertainment's a hugely competitive space. And then people also like like you start connecting the dots too, like or connecting people to this or that, like keeping up with the beer analogy like you don't know like how many people like are connected so like um like impractical jokers so i was just saying impractical jokers. impractical jokers everyone likes impractical jokers for you know it being like a very entertaining absorbable like form of comedy but sal volcano is a great stand-up comedian too mm-hmm. and not a lot of people know that he's doing madison isn't he he's doing madison he's doing and, and that, milwaukee he's to doing- me that that makes for a good angle and mm-hmm. i was gonna ask you um outside of like actual stand-up which i can tell you're very into and passionate about and mm-hmm. so on but uh i guess what other types of angles of funny do, are you personally interested in and um and looking to continue pursuing oh yeah so um i've also had the opportunity of meeting um a couple writers and stuff in austin as well um i'm going to be uh i'm not gonna is, drop is, i'll drop names after we're, we're off air just because it hasn't been like official yet um but i'm gonna be working with some uh very high level youtubers that are in austin a couple oh, of yeah. them are in canada they're flying down to austin because they're big fans of co- comedy and uh, a couple of my buddies are in like they've worked with them in the past and they're just like hey like you want to work with us on this skit or something like that sketch comedy so i definitely love writing like that was actually something that um i've always been naturally good at could always bs a paper like i had i did not understand everything that went into like ap language and comp in high school but i still took it and i still got an a somehow you know like Mm -hmm. i don't know the correct way of writing this or like when to use a semicolon when not to when do i use a comma i don't know that but like naturally like the way i flow and use those things it just works it's like i have an understanding of what it is and i could always bs paper so when you speak people understand you yeah or when you 
when you explicitly write something, people understand what you're trying to say. And that's that's yep. the most important part. I feel like a lot of that grammar shit's getting outdated in a hurry. Yeah, for know? sure. Like, like I if I type a status and... on Facebook, I don't put a period at the end of it because you can tell it's the end of a sentence and a thought uh -huh. because it's all that's there. All, like, I'm not going to fucking punctuate yeah. And nothing. it's not in cursive either. Well, right. <laughs> it's fucking... Major Facebook post in cursive. But... <laughs> like only the grandmas would understand it. They're like, oh yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Um, but no, random I've, side tangent. No, no, that's good. Um, so yeah, I love writing. So definitely going to be getting into more sketch writing and stuff in the future as well. Um, also, knowing, I've I've also got a connection to a director um, in Austin as well who does like short films and also like does stuff for like local Austin. Um, so might be working with him. Uh, even doing like voiceover stuff. So like I, I've always enjoyed podcasting, always good on a mic. Um, people tell me I have a good tone. Like I'm not sharp. I'm not. And that's yeah, just like me blowing tone. myself. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't mean to jerk myself off too much, but it's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Like you, you either have it or you don't. Um, and it's no offense to anybody, but like you just got to be able to control your voice. <clears throat> so doing voiceover work, um, maybe even doing yeah, some like characters for like cartoons and stuff like that would also be fun. In that vein, do you think that some people will just never be stand ups that like don't have it? And no matter how many times they eat shit, practice, they'll just never have it. Yeah, for sure. And it's kind of sad too because. Would you say that that's like a. As like a guess percentage? 70%, probably. Yeah. 70% of the people trying to stand up right now probably aren't going to get it. And, um,. Or they're going to be stuck in the imitating their heroes. Yeah. And or that material is going to be like outdated, you know. So, for instance, uh, uh, Puppet Guy, Jim, uh, uh, the hell is his name? Um, Puppet Guy, Puppet Guy. I know what you're talking about. Fuck. Oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Je Jeff Dunham. Yeah. Jeff Dunham. So, there he, we go. Jeff Dunham was Ahmed the Dead Terrorist. Yes. All that stuff. Like mid 2000s, for some reason, that just hit so killed. hard. <laughs> just killed. And it, yeah, like, that was some that actual shit was on murder. My MySpace, dude. That was some actual murder, I dare say. <laughs> it's weird to say he is still selling out like mega theaters, like mega arenas, like, you know, like those mega churches in Texas that can hold, you know, thousands and thousands of people. He's performing there. With it's pretty almost much like, the same characters. Yes. It's almost like a t it's a type of funny that is funny when you first see it. So it's kind of like once it's big and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the funny's turns. brand new to the yep. new people that are seeing you from your content. Yep. Um, just growing naturally over time and gaining subscribers and follow whatever mm -hmm. it is, you know. And then it turns into um, it's, it turns unoriginal after you've done it so much too. Fuck yeah. And um. I don't There's so say. much beating of dead horses or like not even dead horses. Mm -hmm. They're just horses that have been beat, you know? Yeah. And yeah, you know, if there's still grass on the field, play ball. I get it. But mm -hmm. you brought up Kevin Hart. I think um, I love Kevin Hart. I think he's one of the funniest people to ever live. Um, and I don't think people understand like how he could still just go anywhere and just be funny. But it's still like just Kevin Hart. Very naturally funny, entertaining. Yep. But I think that he is definitely um like i i've watched all of his specials and i think they've definitely been like watered down as like time's gone on and uh i guess another beer example is like 312 for example so 312 <laughs> goose island sponsors. yeah <laughs> goose island was actually bought by budweiser back in 2015 so 312 that makes sense why it's yeah, in it got all your major stores yeah so now like even drinking it I'm like so much lighter, so much not like it's supposed to be like a wheat beer, but it's like not even like a lot of wheat in here. It's just like we'll try to do better for you next time. Jesus. No, it's no, it's good. No, like I, I chose this. I chose to drink this for sure. Um, but yeah, it's just like if you want what Goose Island used to be, um, I believe it's called their their next coast, like their next coast ale, and I think that was like. That's really similar to what Goose Island used to be, the 312. Excuse me. All I right. will have to check that out, mm -hmm. actually. Who is that. your favorite comedian, and who do you think is the best stand-up? <sighs> Not necessarily your favorite, but yep. the best. 
Um, man, that's a good question. I think that right now the best working comedian, um, and probably my favorite, mm, the best comedian right now is Mark Normand by far. So. Yeah, by far. Um, get a chance, go see him live. Uh, killer. Killer, just so smart, so Seems on like top of stuff. He's just got it. He's just got it. He's like autistic in a way where yeah. he just like he just he can't shut it off, and he's like always in really like clean mode. and go with the one liners. Yeah, him, him and Sam Morell are just Sam they're on top. Really good. Sam Morell, those two are like some of the best. They have a podcast together. We might be drunk. I recommend if you guys haven't listened. Um, but yeah, just like they're so. They have that comedy brain that they just can't shut off, and they're always constantly trying to improve. Uh, was this house built on a uh, Indian reservation? I think it might have been. Dude. Would you like Indian to burial say- ground? Native American burial ground? Yeah. <laughs> no, we have Indians <laughs> under my yeah. house. Yeah, I, I'm I thought I smelled Native curry American. earlier. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, uh, going along with that question, actually, um, you you were talking earlier about there being a a difference between being a funny person in like a social setting where mm-hmm. you can feed off of each other's energy and then that not necessarily translating i guess what what type of relationship do you think that has like do you think that if you if you're going to be good at stand up then you at least have to be funny in person or like i guess how would you kind of give it a little breakdown you know um i think also kind of like going back i think that my favorite comic is probably tom segura like my personal favorite um i and then mark norman is the best comedian right now um but like mark norman in person is like very antisocial like not he's not a natural like hang guy not he's very socially person. awkward yeah um that's kind of his whole shtick yeah just being awkward and yeah you, know, you can make it with the awkward persona if mm-hmm. you still, you still got to put it out there that's where awkward people don't do it yep because they get perturbed because everybody in their friend group says, dude, you're pretty awkward. Mm-hmm. But one of my favorite specials of the last, it might, it's in my top five maybe of all time now. Um, it came out in 2017. It's called Three Mics with Neil Brennan. And Neil Brennan also like co created Chappelle's show. He wrote Half Baked, he wrote for all that even so like just kind of like an underground not even underground writer just like an incognito guy like where you see him you'd be like this guy is not a comedian like this guy wrote Chappelle show like yeah it's weird Chappelle. how big Chappelle is and how underground he is yeah and he has a he had a special in 2018 or 17 called three mics and that was like one of the first specials where I was just like this is so different this is so good and no one else is going to be able to replicate it. Um, so three mics, one mic being one liners, like, but um, and then the other one is just stand up, like long form comedy, whatever pace you want to go. And then his middle mic was emotion, like it was real stuff. So every time he would switch mics, it would fade to black, and then it would show him on the new mic. And oh my god, like. It just flew by. Interesting. And See, that's a good angle to take on it. Yeah. In my opinion. Because it also shows, and it's something that stand-up gets a flack for, is people always think that what stand-ups are saying are, like, serious. Like, they think this, or, like, this is their actual opinion on it. Um, and then you get... So he... Basically, if you go to see comedy, like, just know that 99% of what that person says is not true. It's just for, to be funny. It's just to do this. It's supposed to evoke emotion. Um, and some people also need to realize that when you are trying to evoke emotions, stand up. Rule number one, always be funny. Like, always try to be funny. Funny should be goal numero uno. Like, don't try to, don't try to make someone feel bad. Don't try to make someone feel singled out. Like, just make sure that whatever you're about to say is meant to make people laugh and that is something that is like being taken away from comedy or it's like everyone just t- thinks that everything comedians say is true take or like too the, serious take them too serious like if i go if i go to a comedy club like in madison like i did and i perform for like 300 people that's like just know like when i'm telling my holocaust joke it's not 
It's not because you hate Jewish people. No, and it's not and the and like just because I'm talking about the Holocaust, people think I'm I hate Jews. For and real? I'm like, what? I'm a quarter Jew. Like that's not even like <laughs> Like, come on, man. I'm part Swedish here. Like, I don't like. I hate myself, but not the Jew part. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, And it's, yeah, it's tough. But um, yeah, Neil Brennan does a great job of like showing like, hey, this is what comedy is like. This is stand up. And then this is who I really am. And he talks about like his relationship with his dad. He's like the youngest of so many kids. Um, I think 14. Like just huge family. He's the youngest, and he always believed like his dad didn't love him. And hilarious, like, yeah, like super, like <laughs> deep shit. And he talks about his depression and like his like therapy uses that he did, and like what worked, what didn't. And it was just so weird to like see. But then you know, three minutes of that fade to black, and then he goes, "So macaroni and cheese," you know, it's yeah. like, what was this transition? <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, it's really good. Definitely go see it's on Netflix. Um, fantastic um, theo vaughn theo vaughn i could take a leave him no oh! i like theo uh as a person i think he's one of the most clever individuals to ever live yeah his um his metaphors are some of the greatest shit i ever heard oh, he uh he once he was talking about eddie bravo uh brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor eighth tenth planet jiu-jitsu um i remember this one and uh he's just like he's talking about eddie bravo and he's just like yeah eddie bravo is like a uh, like a deaf uh a deaf uh russell terrier and he's just like what he's just like yeah because you you know you keep calling him you're like eddie 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 but he's he's already long gone you can never get him back he's already going down one lane and he's never returning you know he starts saying some crazy shit and never leaves yeah. um he's got some um, his spontaneity is nearly Very unparalleled. Spontaneous. Him and Riff Raff have that video of where they're just like bouncing back and forth, like <laughs> yeah. off the of sayings and shit. And yeah. It's like, what are you talking about? I do agree. I think what you're saying is, as a stand-up man, take mm-hmm. or leave for me. But as a podcaster or just a communicator, one of the best. Yeah, one of the best. And he's never. He always has something to talk about, mm-hmm. which is like also hard because you can start to see lulls in podcast where you're just yeah. like mm, they're fighting you know for scraps right now and just trying to figure out what else to talk about dude is a great talker he can go on mm-hmm. bullshit all oh night. yeah and he can just be funny like talk about like stories when he was a kid and stuff you're like what the fuck are you talking about like delia is really good at that too delia is he's um, really good podcast he's got um congratulations yeah yeah congratulations um i could take her leave delia too um I like his stand up. I liked one of his specials. Um, and then he had like his whole controversy thing that happens. And yeah. it was right after his special came out. It's like, I think of that as like, think about the Oscars, for instance. Like, the Oscars, as soon as Oscar season hits, that's when all the stuff starts coming about, like about this movie and how it doesn't actually accu- accurately portray what actually happened in real life. Right. Um, like with Green Book. You know, with Mahershala Ali and uh, Viggo Mortensen, um, how it's like, oh, the family chimed in. They're like, oh, that stuff actually didn't happen. And uh, Zero Dark Thirty um, somehow having classified information on uh, killing Osama bin Laden and shit. And it's just like, oh, the director is being, you know, looked into by the FBI. But then as soon as Oscar season is done, all the all the charges and investigations are done. What do you think about in general an artist of any sort? um like his legacy being ruined by scandal common examples like michael jackson Mm -hmm. like or still uh, gonna listen to michael jackson yeah even people that um were like victims of michael jackson and they've said that like you know billy jean will come on at the bar they're at and they'll still tap their foot to it you know right like hey it's music theory man hitler hitler very shitty person great painter (laughs) <laughs> you know i think that was definitely cancel culture at its, it's finest you that's know? that's a tough one that i think almost everybody has has a hard time dealing with is is exactly that like you can do some very exceptional shit at the exact same time you're doing some exceptionally terrible shit mm-hmm. you gotta be able to kind of have the to artist separately from the person yeah yeah i think i think that's the most <sighs> reasonable way to do it yep. maybe it's acceptable to not patronize mm-hmm that individual Mm -hmm. but i think it's a little silly to at least entirely dismiss their their work or discredit it Mm -hmm. you obviously have to find the line like the founding fathers yep you know washington jefferson were slave owners yep 
or or at least appreciate the if the you know appreciate genius whether that person is, is who who fucking cares it's always is it's the classic debate of like can you separate the art from the artist mm-hmm. and it's the debate that people will be having like for our entire existence it's also the kind of like similar thing of uh like i think it's like a similar to uh like question as like um like if you go back in time and kill hitler before the holocaust happened but hitler was a baby yeah could you just go shoot that baby uh-huh. and it's just like but it's just like uh, like do you it's like it's morality it's just like it's like do you like do you ever just like go and shoot a baby and then also live with the repercussions of none of that shit's happened yet yeah. and you just shot a baby and yeah. it's like only you're the one that knows about who he becomes really weird shit maybe I'll just like maim the baby yeah you don't have to kill yeah. it oh uh oh man give it a speech impediment yeah. whitest kids you know maybe like <laughs> they have a get baby him to flunk in or, school or something yeah it man it's that's a good question though um who has suffered the most from cancel culture comic wise comic wise uh delia went through the shit show shane gillis but he came up really good on it yep and uh yeah he fucking got paid by snl too like he got 30 grand as his little signing bonus ck but didn't he didn't he bounce back too (sighs) kind of yeah he did um i think also louis is one of the best stand-ups ever of all time and i used to not like him like i i was raised so like conservatively and religious that i just like as soon as I started hearing him, like just like talk shit about like you know the Catholic Church and you know just saying pussy and stuff and fuck and stuff everywhere. Like I'm just like I was raised on comics like Jeff Foxworthy and Bill Enval and Ron White. And Ron White's a little dirtier than the others, but yeah, um, yeah uh, Layer the Cable Guy. Like I will always have uh, a special place in my heart for like that blue collar comedy because that was the first comedy i ever watched like my first stand-ups i ever watched was them and then that introduced me to what comedy central is and then comedy central introduced me to comedy central presents so i was able to start watching 22 minutes of stand-up comedy and like enjoy it but also like stand-up comics that people don't even like remember like todd glass even though todd glass is still working to this day and he's still a really fucking funny comedian and he's opening up for people like uh jim gaffigan but you know those people were all Comedy Central people. But the big show was HBO. So, like, you wanted to be on HBO to get your special and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, watching Dane Cook in, you know, 1999 or 2001, just like in a wife beater and just doing some of the craziest stand-up I've ever seen at in fourth grade, me watching that and going, yes, like, this is yeah. this is funny. But now I would never watch that around my parents. Or subject a fourth grader to that. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it was actually funny. But we also got away with like stuff like Family Guy too. Yeah. And and like uh, Adult Swim in general, like kind of like, oh, it's cartoons, but it's also like. That kind of progressed my humor in a lot of ways. Yes. Really watching a lot of Family Guy and and that type of related um, cartoon humor, which I'm a really big cartoon fan just Mm -hmm. because. and, And. it's something that kind of redefined my view of funny and led to my actual one of my early, earlier questions of what else you want to do with it is like that's I think in in my personal bias I like productions a little bit better like yep. Jackass is fucking hilarious and it's more like a timelessly funny I think that you know even like Family Guy and it's kind of like when you're playing God and especially in a cartoon it's all fucking created for the production mm-hmm. you know you just have a different realm of creative control and and capabilities accordingly so that's why i uh eric andre show it's like one of the funniest fucking mm-hmm. shows ever in my opinion um mm-hmm. uh, that's just kind of my my view on it so there's always more ways to integrate comedy with almost anything mm-hmm. and uh Even something like the movie step brothers that can't be conveyed in a stand-up way like it has no to no no it's too epically funny and yeah. is worthy of a story and I'll, I'll i'll usually lean into it you know like a lot of times i'm not a big movie fan because the story is not really pertinent to me yeah. or i feel that it doesn't really bear much um value for me to hear reiterated similar plot lines and mm-hmm. stuff i think and, goal, goal number one that's a good point goal number one of any movie of any genre make sure the story is good please characters are likable 
and then move forward with whatever direction you want to take it. So horror movie 101, make a movie that's written well and that you can turn, you know, add now add make a good drama, but then add a supernatural element to it. Make a good comedy, add a supernatural element to it. Um, and there are a couple movies that do that super well. Um, one of them being Hereditary. Um, great, just like family drama. And then let's put in some supernatural shit. Have you guys seen Hereditary? <laughs> you guys got some homework to do. You at home as well. Go watch Hereditary. Um, great movie. Naked Brothers Band. Um, Alex Wolf, isn't it? Um, it's so weird to see those kids grow up and just do something that's not Nickelodeon. Um, same thing with like Ariana Grande. How you doing? Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. So comedy, Step Brothers, other guys. Um, oh, what was the other one that just came out recently? Um, with, uh, Russell Crowe and it is also something guys. Um, nice guys. Nice guys. Did you watch that movie? Yeah. I enjoyed that one thoroughly yeah. too. I thought that was really fun. Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling, that guy can act. He can yeah. do it all. <laughs> he he can do got it, all. it all. He's got. I'm like, fuck. He's funny too. Shit. <laughs> like that. That sucks. So he's got the whole package. He is balding, but I'm balding. So it's like, damn it. Like I thought I had him. I need uh, something on this guy. Yep. And uh, yeah. So no, I love I love comedy in like in all forms. And uh, I was actually having my conversation with my dad about this. Um, which is a good thing that you brought up jackass because he like, again, like my dad, like overthinks stuff. He like overanalyzes things. And I don't know if it's just like, cause of the time he's from where he's from, like where he grew up. Um, but he's just, he doesn't get jackass. He's like, so Jordan, if you saw a baby carriage rolling down the hill and then someone hit it with the car, yes, <laughs> are you laughing at that? And I'm like, no, uh, I'm like, uh, I'm not laughing. I'm laughing at this <laughs> because I'm in on the joke. Like, if if I just turn on the TV and they didn't tell me, like, this is a fake baby. We're going to see what kind of reactions we can get. Then I'm going in blind and I'm just going to react like, oh, my God, that car just hit a baby. Yeah. You know, but now that I know and then people know, obviously, after everything, like they get all, like all the reaction and stuff they need they're like also just so everyone knows like this is not a real baby yeah. you know mind you they used to not do that stuff in the early jackass days they used to just like get up and leave after they do some shit that's crazy um i mean that's fucking even funnier in my opinion yeah that's why so many it's faces like, were blurred in jackass because they never got uh, like consent. approval <laughs> consent from those people to use them like you're gonna be on an mtv show so at its heart simplest definition they say comedy is surprise Oh, like what is comedy? So there's, um, and I can't get the number right. So there is, there's a few different things that evoke laughter. And I think it's eight things. Um, the ones that I use usually are surprise, um, and connection. So connecting two things that being relatable, see, yeah, and make them relatable, even though at the first, um, oh, yeah. Surprise, coincidence, and connection. So that's like three of them right there that I use. Tr try to do the most common. Um, and then also, um, oh, I can't remember. Uh, and then also shock is one as well. Like where something just so ridiculous happens. That kind it's of like, the jackass the style. Yeah, exactly. So that can elicit laughter as well. Um, now, usually everything works best in combination. Like you get a recipe down. You add a little bit of this, that. So um, what separates then like your dad's reaction to Jackass and our reaction where we see it as funny and he sees it as shocking in a bad way? Yeah, because he can't get over. He puts himself in the place of the viewer on the street, not the viewer on the couch. You know, so is that like a relatable thing? Yeah, he tries to he tries to put himself in the shoes of that person right. and not in the shoes of I'm just watching this. Um, same thing. Like if someone tells a joke about something that's like near and dear to you, like religious jokes bother my dad and like i get it but also like i and i told him and this is for everybody like if you get offended at a joke i think offense comes from insecurity like and in why you have belief in whatever that is so if you don't think something's funny and then you can't get past like enjoying someone else's rest of their act like i don't mind if you don't like a joke I mean, it's like ah, i didn't like that one what else do you got 
That should be the mindset that people have when going and right. seeing comedy. Not that, man, that one joke fucked really me up so. It. Yeah, it really yeah. ruined the I'll rest of that. I'll never laugh at this guy again. Yeah. And then it's like, no, like. I, That's how a lot of people are, mm-hmm. though. They spend their lives looking for, like, just reasons to hate or detest mm-hmm. or or stay away, push people away. Yep. It's, it's like a toxic it's kind of like mindset that's also a problem with like cancel culture too is like that's like the heartstone of it yeah it's like you go to a place to have fun like knowing that the like the purpose of this place is to make you laugh not to offend you not to be taken seriously it's just like you go to a club that's why i love comedy on state so much is that there's all college kids there and madison's also a very democratic city but people go there and they have a blast because they know that the shit down there is like joking. You can't have your phone on. No recordings. No nothing. If you go to see Tony Hinchcliffe or Joe Rogan or Dave Chappelle, like you get your phone locked up. Like it gets put in a bag. You can't access it. It's just you and like what's going on and just knowing that why you're there. So if you're going there to find issue with what that person is talking about, you're not at the right place. Right. Go do that in a debate room. Like if you want to go give someone a piece of your mind or, you know, debate on like whether you're right or they're right. It doesn't matter when you're in a comedy club, man. It's just like and the master of that's Bill Burr, like being yeah. able to just have like a counterpoint that's so ridiculous that if you don't think he's joking, like I want you to like fucking drive your car and do like a telephone pole. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think that I'm telling the truth and I am. I mean that. <laughs> Fucking kill yourself. Um, not a joke. Not not a joke. No, you can hear by my tone and by the side f- note. I think yeah. Chappelle is one of the best and very funny, but he did get pretty caught up in the transgender or you know the trans whatever uh, conversation, the debate where like the last couple of his specials were focused on that. Mm-hmm. It's like, dude, you're a lot funnier than this, you know? For sure. Get your jokes out. Mm-hmm come up with something different that's that kind of goes back to what i was talking about because i think Chappelle is the goat like i think he's the greatest of all time and i don't think there's anyone that can really be funnier than him um because he can also do shit for four and a half hours and be just fine just yeah i mean that's most insane, naturally bro. funny dude mm-hmm. that i've ever seen but he's also one of the greatest speakers of all time too yeah like that's the other issue yes. is that not only is he funny but he can also keep your attention keep you captivated he's like a martin luther king of our time man yeah. like where if he's speaking people are listening in yeah and um but no i do agree that um like if you get caught on a certain subject then know when to get off or else then people are like you're spending too much time on cut this. your loss type cut your deal. loss yeah. or just know that hey you've already checked that box like let's move to another one it's probably like part of his long-term strategy because mm-hmm. like people are talking about it more than mm-hmm. pretty much anything he's done the last decade mm-hmm. so like yeah, his goal more is being views. reached, more views, mm-hmm. more, more controversy. controversy. Like yep. that's that's the button, and that he, you know, to that's like you know, so the I say, sticking point to kind of grind on. The way yeah. I say but, it a lot of times is that you know it's the negative attention is good attention type of thing. Yeah, or, yeah. Um, any attention is good. And that's you know, for up general. is down is how I see it. You would think a lot of the things would be bad that actually turn out being good, or mm-hmm. maybe even vice versa, but more so more so the former i would say and that's like for general attention but like in my opinion as far as just comedy and being a fan of comedy like yeah i want to laugh at other stuff now yeah you know i mean as far as getting more eyes on you that's working as far as like your comedy following yeah and i also and think he- it's a stepping stone too with comedy so if you're if you're thinking to yourself i don't necessarily like stand up but like i would like to be but i just haven't found anything that i jive with Kind of going back to beer. It's like, I believe that there is a beer out there for everybody. It just takes you like taking the effort and finding it and yeah. trying things and then knowing when to shut off, yeah. like, you know, when to dump it down the drain. And uh, like, I've probably watched, probably taken it, like watched, listened to probably over a hundred thousand hours of comedy in my life. And that's really fucking, that's a big number. Let's break that down into days. But it's like, I've probably spent years of my life just taking in comedy and enjoying it like thoroughly. Um, I've watched almost every special on Netflix, no matter if it's someone that I know, someone that I don't know going back and watching the classics. Like I just watched uh, Richard Pryor live in concert for the first time from 1979. That still holds up to this day. It's crazy. I haven't seen a lot of prior stuff. That's when I need to crazy go on Netflix, watch it. That shit still holds up. Do you like Lenny Bruce? So I've I've given Lenny Bruce a couple tries, 
Um, he's like the godfather of comedy, right? Yeah. Stand up. He's the one that did the most for comedy, as they say. Like, he's the one that pushed the boundaries first. Um, but then now I'm looking at it through a 21st century lens, and I'm just like, I can respect that he did that for comedy, but like now, like him and George Carlin and stuff like that, it's just like, you're there. Like, I know you're a great. You're just not my favorite. Like right. I, I know that you push times me have off. changed. Right. Those seven words it's like aren't listening that bad to anymore. a song. Exactly. You know, a lot of times I hear music now and I'm like, this is good, but I don't like it. Yeah, it's like mm. I, I think that Richard Pryor is definitely like the uh, like the queen of its time of, of his time. Like I can listen to Queen all day every day, and it still holds up to this day. It's also back to like music theory, comedy theory. Like as long as you have like that right recipe, that right formula, it's gonna be good no matter what decade it's from. And uh, Pryor is definitely one of those people. Um, Kinnison also can still, he's just loud. And everyone has a loud face too, like in comedy. That's something that I'm not a big fan of stand up about is that it seems way too easy to be overly contemporary. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you say you watch it from 40 years ago and you're shocked that it's still funny today, it's kind of like, yeah, when I listen to songs from 40 years ago that people thought were dope back then, I still think they're pretty dope now. Yeah. But, I don't know. It's just one of my personal quirks with it and um, something I would see as like an, a an general room for improvement for, um, I mean, probably more so people starting off, I guess. Mm-hmm. But really, that's, kind of beyond that's just my stand opinion. Up, that's kind of just comedy in general, I think. Like the who's on first skit yeah. is like uh-huh. funny, but, you know, mm-hmm. let's hear some fucking swear words, you know, like. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, no, I, I agree. And yeah. now it's kind of like, if you could do something that's timelessly funny, which is kind of how I see, like, uh, even, you know, you said, like, Step Brothers earlier or something like that mm-hmm. or other productions. I don't know. It's, it's always just, pushing the envelope. You know, at some point, Step Brothers is oh, going like sure. Charlie Chaplin. The Dark Knight. A- absolutely. For stuff sure. Like for that. sure. Yeah. It's like they'll always be good, like, in their own way, like... The Dark Knight definitely is like one of the best superhero movies ever made. But mm-hmm. then it's like also it can always be reinvented, yep. repolished, mm-hmm. made more contemporary, whatever, and so on. And I definitely get that. But there's definitely times and um with comedy for me at least, is like you find like your your honest you you reflect so much. Like there's so much self reflection after every set, you know, you record your shit. Like I have a recording on my phone from Huntley two weeks ago I, I did a show in Huntley and I've never done that venue before it was their first time having comedy at this place at a brewery and uh Sue hopped not great beer but decent people <laughs> uh definitely their German Pilsner is good so get that um but yeah and there's there's this thing with comedy called ambushing so what a booker will do well, he'll go to a venue that normally doesn't have comedy, like bars. Like we have Louis and Roscoe that has comedy. People not expecting comedy, and then you ambush them, saying, "Hey, I want to do a comedy show here." Mm. And then it's like, "Oh yeah, oh, yeah, we'll do that." And then the people that come, if it's a free show, sometimes people do it the right way. Um, I did a show in uh, the Wisconsin Dells. It's a uh, Gravity Box Brewing. Um, it might be Boston, technically. Excuse me, um, but. They actually did like an event bright, sold tickets, closed down the brewery, and then opened it up for the show, and then reopened it as a tap room after the show was done. And I'm like, what a great way to do that. Mm. Like, what a great way to do that. Buy tickets so that you know everyone there is there for comedy, you right. know? So that's definitely yeah, it's a, a little with the ambushing. weird when, you know, two thirds of the bar was just there to fucking drink and eat, you know? Yeah, and catch up. And is Louis still doing their thing? Yeah, yeah. I did. Um, I did Louis at the end of November. Um, I hosted, and that was a sh- that wasn't a shit show. Um, got to work with some comedians from Chicago that I haven't worked with and since I started, pretty much. Um, I really enjoyed Louis' thing. I haven't been in a few months. Just yeah, because time and stuff. But. No, for sure. They got good. They got good acts that go there. It was kind of like your time with the ambush, though. Like yep. uh, a couple times ago when we were there. Um, I think his name is Derek Jones. Derek Jones was doing his bit. I'm pretty sure it was him. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about uh, like a gingerbread cookie missing a limb or something about diabetes. Mm-hmm. And some lady walked out. It wasn't even like that raunchy or offensive. Yeah. No, he, it was just basic diabetes stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he yeah. was like heckling her on the way out. And it was like, y'all 
shouldn't even have come like you should have been like oh they're doing funny stuff here i'm gonna i'm gonna <laughs> yeah exactly it's like you've sat through a majority of it like why don't you finish right you know, that one? and you said the right word earlier with the insecure dude mm-hmm. the insecure get offended the most yeah know why it's bothering you so much and then get over it like because now it's, it's not and it's a lot of deep-seated issues where people just have shitty beliefs and when you have shitty beliefs that aren't very concrete or well thought through while well, you spend your whole life building beliefs on your beliefs mm-hmm. so then you end up with even shittier beliefs and that's why you're so easily offended and insecure because deep yeah. down your beliefs are shit mm-hmm. and, and yeah, poorly if, supported if you can't like if you can't defend your beliefs or establish like why you have them in the first place then it's just like do you really believe that then right like mm-hmm. like what where's like it's like a what do they call it like a straw man argument you know where it's just like there's not a lot underneath of it you know mm-hmm. it's 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 gonna crumble it's gonna it's gonna tear poorly apart. structured yeah Dude, logic then, class should be standard in high school man yeah that was a class that i took at rbc and it made a lot of sense yeah and it it's should. like it's damn logic. i know about 300 people that need to take this shit like yesterday mm-hmm. you know yeah logic philosophy great great courses to take really opens up your mind and like i into. wouldn't say to pursue it you know as a career a career or anything like that but just 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 take a course in it a semester or something you know yeah. like that's why i say it'd be good in in high school in my opinion mm-hmm. but our whole school curriculum is abhorrently fucked in my opinion yeah it's not really and, and incredibly outdated yeah it's not really teaching us for the the future it's just like ah man it's i can go into the whole whole rabbit hole of that shit but yeah it's just like Maybe yeah we'll- Maybe we'll dodge that one. We'll a dodge bit. that bullet a little bit. We'll, we'll matrix. We've, we'll we've, matrix we've spoken that. enough. Yeah. That's enough about them damn kids. Them damn kids. Their damn dog. I tell you, I'm glad I'm not in school anymore, though, or, or just dealing with it. We were talking earlier. You, you got out of college right before the pandemic, and mm-hmm. that was probably yeah a good thing it definitely put thing, things into perspective for me because like i was talking to you guys before the podcast like i was going to pursue my doctorate in physical therapy and uh, it's funny there's a couple i can think of one off the top of my head who got his doctorate in physical therapy and then stopped practicing to go full-time comic you know he doesn't have his license anymore shout wow. out chrissy d chris chris stefano um great comic fun guy um go see him if you can as well he's also really good in person yeah i like him um yeah, but it, it definitely just put things and education is always going to be there. So, like, if I do this and it doesn't work, then I can always go back to school. Right. But for I was just another so, couple years or whatever. I was just so burnt out. Like, I switched majors when I was at Rock Valley. I was business first and then I went to science. So, I had to go take all these classes that I wouldn't have. It like put me two years behind practically. Um, and science is a tough major it is because business didn't put me like it didn't put me in chemistry or biology or anatomy or anything like that so i had to take that so when i transferred to chicago um uic um when i transferred there i was like practically transferring as a sophomore instead of a junior you know so i was a year behind there but also i was a year behind at rock valley because i switched majors and i just loaded up on classes just trying to get my associates so I do have an associates. I have a bachelor's, but I put the doctorate on hold because it was just like, just eating me up, man. It's fucking At a certain me point, up. I don't think it's worth it. It wasn't. You know? That shit will kill you, dude. Mm-hmm. It sucks the life out of you and then some. And it seems all obedience oriented in, my, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And I think comedy, like, it also, like, just, like, frees me up, like, so like it just makes me feel like my, like it, it's like my truest self you know it's invaluable to express yourself yeah oh that's a good way to say invaluable it. i um like i did comedy the night that me and my girlfriend broke up um and that was a bad breakup for me and i decided that i'm gonna go up on stage and just like kind of like work it off like because we were supposed to do something that night we broke up and i'm like well now what the fuck am i supposed to do and then I went and did stand up, and guess what? I fucking bombed. I fucking ate dog shit. I mean, it was not a good. It was not a good set at all. And uh, I even talked about like, yep. Yeah. I'm like, just so everyone knows, like, yeah, me and my girlfriend broke up, and I, I got off stage like it just was not a good set. And uh, the guy, I go to the bar to like get. It's called like a Chicago handshake, and it's an old style. Excuse me, it's an old style, and then shot of whiskey. 
for like five bucks. They also call it like a Taylor Street handshake in Chicago. Um, but yeah, it, it, and I just went and I got it and I just took my shot and drank my beer. And he was just like, did uh, do you and your girl really break up? And I'm like, yeah, that is true. And he's like, man, that sucks. And I'm like, yeah, it does. And he's just like, thanks. He goes, well, he goes, I'll buy, I'll buy your fucking drinks tonight. He goes, if you want to go ham, he goes, I did that last year and it definitely sucked. And someone bought me my drink. So I'm just paying that forward to you. <laughs> and he's just like, I'm like, yep. Yep. Thank you. And then it was just like, man, I'm like, I wasn't like, I wasn't the best boyfriend. I just ate shit doing something that I like, you know, um, like my friends just moved away. I have like, I'm done with school. I'm like, man, this really fucking sucks. Like, I'm kind of like losing everything that like was establishing me. You got to take them punches. And I, and I was just fucking taking them on the chin. And I was mm-hmm. like, basically, my eyes were rolling in the back of my head. But I had to like fucking knock them forward like a like a magic eight ball and like get the answer. It's like, yeah, like you're, you're going to be all right. <laughs> so I just kept doing it and just writing and getting better and understanding. And that was something that made me fall in love with stand up and actually made me really um like I can never pay, you know, it's a weird thing to say. I owe Joe Rogan so much because he's the one that got me like really nerded out for stand up comedy, like going over the craft, joke writing, talking to other comics and just like, I'm like, man, I'm like comic comedy is so much more than just telling a funny story. Like there is actual like there is a formula, like there is something that I have to follow to make shit work. And uh, that dude probably is responsible for a hundred thousand people. I'm definitely gonna out. look into oh, the, yeah. the eight. Um, what? How did you describe them? Like coincidence and uh, hmm. shock. What do you call them? So uh, there's like the eight, um, the eight things that evoke laughter. Oh, and okay. one of them, yeah. So a surprise, connection, coincidence, shock. Um, there's a couple more. I think mm-hmm. one is like, I think one of them technically is like love. Um, or like, uh, um, so like a way that I describe my comedy, uh, relatability definitely is on there. Oh yeah. So like one of my favorite things is like, I'm, I'm starting to understand like what kind of comic I want to be. And I want my, my stuff to be as relatable as possible so that I can touch, you know, more people. Um, you know, probably less than Michael Jackson, but just like touch more people like in a way that is somewhat familiar, but like a new take on things, you know, so familiar, but different. Like, that's just like a way that I want to like make myself as a comic just so I'm digestible, but also, you know, and don't think that like when people do comedy, they try to like push barriers. Like you don't have to be Lenny Bruce, you know, you don't have to be Carlin. Like you don't have to do shit like that. Um, and then also take your time, like, that's like the biggest thing with Austin right now is everyone's just trying to rush the process. And it's just like, oh, yeah, you can go up five nights, you know, five times a night, five t- five nights a week, you know, seven times a week. Like, yeah, but also you're living in your car. Like, I know so many people that live in their cars that don't have jobs. I'm like, you've only been doing stand up for a year, two years. I'm like, just because you're a good joke writer, like, doesn't mean that you're going to be famous You know, like people like Mark Norman, Sam Morrell that are great, great comics. Like they've only become regulars at like, for instance, like, uh, uh, man, the comedy seller in New York, just like, uh, or the comedy store in LA. Like as soon as you become passed as a regular, those are people that have been working their ass off to get there that have put years in, you know, you need that consistency. Yeah. And it's like, they're 10 years in 16 years in, and they finally got passed. They're finally making it. So don't, don't speed up the process. Like, yep. You also, might be in the right place in the right time doing the right shit, and it's just going to take you a while to get the right look. Exactly. And then also don't overstay your welcome either, like at places. Like don't like do well and then like, you know, say your goodbyes and like leave. Like don't overstay your welcome. Don't try to like, you know, force anything. Let it all come naturally. Like my Tony Hinchcliffe story, for example. Like I think Tony still remembers who I am. Um, probably because I was one of the least weird guys that he's met while living in Austin. You know? <laughs> like that's like, yeah, you are a little, a little not, you're, you're, you're not that weird. You're not that weird. Hey, I mean, that's I mean, you're, you're not too weird. Not, not, not Austin weird. weird. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, mean, I, I mean, that was slogan. the vibe down there. Yeah. Keep it weird. Keep it weird. Austin, keep it weird. And I'm just like, Ooh. yeah. Um, 
something that's definitely surprised me is that uh, they have like an open, um, like an open, not camp. Uh, they have that as well. Not anymore. Uh, but they have like an open wear, not open carry, but like they don't have to uh, wear, uh, women don't have to wear like bras or t-shirts or anything like that. They can just. Fantastic. Yeah. So you'll just be like walking in like Zilker Park and they'll just be like a girl just like tits out just like tits does, does madison have something like that madison too? has like their uh they have something similar i know they have like the naked cycling and stuff that you're able to do like just like go fully naked and ride bikes i'm like what the fuck i remember seeing this chick walk out of uh we were up there looking at different vape shops <laughs> and i was looking at this like, girl's apartment uh, and i just saw through the window yeah she's right through the window yeah, can you believe that window. yeah she was on this the place sixth, is amazing she's on the sixth story she almost knocked me off my ladder but shit like <laughs> just right there in the open for me to see <laughs> i couldn't believe it <laughs> so what if i was dressed up like a comcast guy like i wasn't fixing shit <laughs> that, that's funny <laughs> Dude, I don't care who you are. Like, just saying, like, boobs, like, at any time, like, in the wild. Always a welcome sight. That's such a good thing. That's like, that's how, that's, that's that, like nice, yeah. man. Like, yes. a vagina, like, not, like, it's like, oh, that's a vagina. But every time you see, like, a boob, it's like. They're so nice, much man. more presentable. Yeah. yeah. Even if you're not a boob guy, it's you'd like, oh, shit, that was a boob. You see that? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Like, yeah. I consider myself more like an ass guy than a boob guy, but, like gotta appreciate the rack nonetheless yep exactly. exactly and like you said it's just like a it's like a, a smile plus you know like everybody secretly likes to see you smile everybody secretly likes to see yep. tits. don't matter if homeboy is super gay or whatever he mm-hmm. still likes he if there's tits he's looking doesn't matter you know yep and they're always out you're in hardwired they're always to like out in Austin, and it's just like nice like it's been a while i mean since i've seen some because it's gotten colder too but it's like oh shit like that's that's a pair of tits right there nice but you're not like oh nice like you're not fucking like just jerking off in front of them and stuff like it's just like dudes get weird like that dudes get weird probably how it should be yeah you know yeah it's just like oh like there's someone you know in their own skin just kind of confident and it's like nice it's just like hey lady nice tits like you don't even have to say that it's just like okay it's just someone doing what they want <laughs> nice like you know why you're saying nice but uh the forbidden nipple yep uh but uh yeah man austin's weird as hell too like weird group of people coming through well and some I, of the weirdest shit that you've kind of touched on or or seen around like I just know, some unconventional shit that you maybe wouldn't think of <laughs> yeah because I, I got the vibe of it but i didn't really dive in and and see you know x porn too, too stars much. for sure x porn stars porn stars that's for like sure. a common thing not super common but i got two of them and like our comedy scene it's just like super weird like they're not like they don't brag about it or anything like that but they're also like not keeping it a secret and uh i just like you look familiar for some reason. I just like couldn't put my finger on it. And then I go into like, you know, the club and uh, the door guy's like, you know, that's what's your face, right? And I'm like, what? That's I'm like, like Brazzers? And it's like, yeah, that one. And I'm like, no fucking way. It's like, dude, pull it. And we're just like watching fucking porn at the front door of the creek in the cave. And it's like, that's fucking her. Holy shit. It's got fucking 18 million views on this one video. And she's just talented gal, talented gal, huge boobs. Shout out Molly. Good girl. Not her porn name, obviously. But, yeah. Um, it's been crazy just kind of, like, hearing, like, her experiences and stuff and what brought her out to Austin and just meeting really cool people. But also people that are so pretentious, like, expecting to be, like, hand-fed, like, their entire time there. It's just, like, Super you gotta make... entitled. hmm Yeah, and, that shit drives me nuts. And, it's like, one of my favorite things... Um, my buddy connor like i was like definitely doubting like there's always doubt and you should have a little bit of doubt like just because you're like like have confidence in yourself but also know like hey if you don't do this right then you're gonna be fucked be realistic yeah you got to be realistic and know what what could come like if if things fail and my buddy connor said hey like you're gonna do great because you make opportunities you don't let opportunities come to you you create your own exactly and i was just like thanks man i'm like that was like like one of the nicest things that anyone's ever said to me and it made me feel that's one of the best ways to be in general yeah and no matter what type of bad shit happens to you you, you, that's like the life lemonades 
type of yeah. analogy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've, I've enjoyed Austin thoroughly. I still miss Chicago so much. Chicago's still best city in the world and got a lot of memories there. And I feel like I left not on my own terms. I left because COVID and uh, Illinois didn't want to pay me unemployment. So fucking looking at you, Pritzker. What the fuck, man? Pritzker. Yeah. Uh, Pritzker sucks. It's, it was such a bad thing. And I kept trying to call like the state and then also the IRS just trying to figure out like, hey, what's uh, what could no possibly answers? the reason? Like I'm not making enough money. I'm like, I'm, I'm like fresh out of college salary. And uh, yeah, I'm not getting anything. So what's that? And of course, it's like there's 80,000 people ahead of you, like waiting to get that same question answered. And uh, yeah, never heard back from them. And uh, so I moved back here, got a job at a butcher shop. So you can really tell where all those entitlements go when stuff like that happens. For sure. Um, Yep. And so again, like kind of had to create my own opportunity. I I built a PC and learned how to stream and I I already enjoyed playing video games with my friends and then just making that an avenue for revenue um, and built a community. And it's been great. Follow me on Twitch, Grizzly Beard Man Live. Going to be starting up streams again in January when I get back to Austin. Um, And then also doing probably like a live podcast on there and then putting that out on like Spotify and stuff. Um, But yeah, definitely have to hustle man it's all about hustle it's all about grinding like getting yourself out there let your other creating let your other avenues like lead everyone to the same like lead everyone back to you so like whether you're streaming comedy podcasting put the lines out yeah put the lines out but keep them together so it's a net exactly and then you'll catch something you know yeah you'll catch more and that's why i'm also going to start doing the road more for comedy for sure like next year i'm probably going to be indianapolis fort wayne and then also go up to new york the next month and try to do a circuit there and then orlando that's for, pretty cool. Do, yeah. do comics often like tour together, kind of, or is that not really a thing? They do. Like you find like if it's like a bigger mm-hmm. like you tour find someone something. like like that you want to do like the road with. It helps a ton. Um, like hey, like you know me and my buddy um, Sam, or me and my buddy um, you know Seth. Like we're gonna go like do a couple spots here and there. If you want to drive, obviously that helps. Airbnbs, hotels, you get to split the price. It's definitely more effective that way. Um, I'm very fortunate to be in a good job where I get paid well and like gives me- able to work remotely too. Exactly. So that's why I love this job. Yeah, so- uh, That's super important, dude. Regardless of, of what you're doing, I think it's very important to have a job that offers you the flexibility that you want to pursue other things you know don't just get a job and then that's it yeah um i don't see why so many people run it that way yeah also don't quit your job because yeah yeah don't don't have it all in one stand up like a lot of like in my mind i can think of a lot of comics that were working other jobs up until about four years ago you know and that was them doing 10 years of comedy you know so definitely blows my mind at how many people aren't doing anything and then also what are your parents paying for like it's like how can you afford apartment in austin and not work and then have a car and then have the time to write and do all this shit like i know that you working a doorman you know or as a server three nights a week is not paying rent you know mm-hmm. yeah rent's probably pretty steep out there i yep. imagine and i hear it's not paying your bills, not paying insurance. It's not doing this and that. It's like, what are we doing? How are you getting that money? Like, and your parents are only going to be around for so long to like, you know, keep giving handouts. And I don't want to say everyone's doing that because a lot of people are grinding and I respect that. Um, living in their cars, shit like that. Um, yeah. But also just know, I also feel like people jump head first into a shallow pool and like they have floaties on and stuff like that and it's just like it's just you're putting too much like you're putting too much security on like what you have you know um or they dive into the deep end with nothing on and they don't know how to swim so like people that go like i said they're one year into comedy and they quit their job and they're living in their car to like make it it's like 
It well, does produce some of the best results sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it produces Starving method. artists. Starving artists, for sure. Like, how many people have done that in L.A.? You know? Like, mm-hmm. I want to be an actor, actress, um, director. Like, they drop everything. They fill up their little 1999 Toyota Corolla, and then they just drive to L.A. and make it make it happen. Same thing with New York. Um, opportunities are there. Um, there's more opportunities there, but also it comes back to you can make your own opportunities no matter where you're at. Especially um, with the internet. Yeah. And if you're willing to put the effort into it, you know? So just because there's more opportunity, like with LA, I was talking to my dad about this last night too. It's like when you want to go to like a movie, like if you want to audition, like let's just say they're looking for um, a bearded guy with brown hair and he's 6'3, six, 6'4, six, and weighs over 250. When I go to that audition, there's going to be 50 people that look exactly like me and it makes me look no different. Mm-hmm. it's like what makes me me you know and those people i don't know like there's more opportunity there but also everyone's trying to take advantage of that opportunity and austin is like that right now for sure with comedy so just like knowing who you are outside of comedy so like i still enjoy movies like i still enjoy riding my bike i still enjoy boxing i still enjoy, enjoy doing all these things besides comedy so don't no matter what you do don't abandon yourself like know what makes you unique why your friends like you why your family loves you um you know why your you know spouse or your you know whoever your partner um make sure that you are continuing to do like the things that make them like you attracted to you stuff like that um and like reaffirming that like just because you're doing something doesn't mean it's going to change you um you know for the worse you know so just make sure that yeah you keep holding on to like what makes you you and don't try to sell out for anybody for like an opportunity or you know to try to be you know the you know the marble statue that you know that hollywood has carved you um shit like that so just yeah be different be unique or else everything's gonna look cookie cutter and there's a lot of cookies out there man it's a lot yeah. a lot of cookies you yep. know so even if you're an it's oreo try to be like a one. vanilla one you know or a lemon yeah Uh-oh, oreo. Be, be your Uh-oh. own Uh-oh. be your own Uh-oh. shade man mm-hmm. yeah have your own energy mm-hmm. i uh yeah i've uh definitely struggled with that in the past and moving to austin also was like i was putting so much effort into comedy and like putting myself like in these situations where it's like all right i forgot what the quote was it's like a good like um or like great things come from um the right amount of material but with not enough time or something like that so just like great things come from that. Like when there's a project to be done, but there's like a time limit and it seems like it's impossible to do. That's like when great things are made. Hmm. So I've also- A lot of times pressure makes diamonds. Exactly. So putting myself into those situations has made me better for it, but then it's also like definitely shot myself in the foot. Right. Yeah. You're not going to, just because you have a high pressure situation one time doesn't mean you're going to meld into a diamond, but yeah, definitely see value in- uh, in that approach and 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 being timely enough or timely to the point of of building pressure mm-hmm. i was winking at marco I'm like, quick, quick <laughs> i was thinking of just lane maxwell as i was winking at you <sighs> you're thinking about to that verdict today oh you oh, got a free shit. just lane post today i saw that i did i did <laughs> you douchebag free jizz lane i said uh if it free what, jizz stain man if the Get narrative doesn't fit then you must acquit oh man <laughs> a, i haven't been following it too much but it's a weird one like there's a lot of substance there and a lot of the book was redacted of you know the book of names oh really so like we're talking about How is chris tucker's off was he i think he was on there yeah yeah so there's big names like that and Trump and Clinton, but they have like dozens or hundreds of names redacted. What are those names? Yeah. You have a prince and two presidents on there. Yeah. What are those names? Yeah. Who's bigger than that? Yeah, mm. for real. It's like, who's got money? Putin? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is Putin on there? Yeah. Everybody in world finance. Yeah. G-G-P. They're probably out on Pedo yeah. Island. Yeah. JP Morgan and Chase. JP like, Morgan? Uh-huh. Charles Safe Schwab? Bet. Charles Safe Schwab? Bet. <laughs> <laughs> 
Chipotle? <laughs> I, heard no. he was, I heard he was there. Uh, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Chipotle himself. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah. Goes back That's to what you good. said earlier. Mm-hmm. I might guess be I, a shit person, but those burritos, man, they're I think, good. I think I think Ghislaine tried to like out Pizza the Hut and she's losing like pretty bad. <laughs> I think that's what it comes down to. Let's get down to brass tacks here. Yeah. Yep. Papa yeah. John's yeah. is gonna be on there. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Oh, I'm just gonna get that young pussy. <laughs> <sighs> Have you seen him, man, when he was cracking there at the end? He's uh, pretty bad. I haven't yeah. seen too much follow up, but a little oh, bit. he was going crazy. He's I know like, he's I've been. Eaten, I've eaten thirty-seven pizzas this month. <laughs> yeah, he goes. I've seen them changing the formula. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, man? he's still eating more than a pizza a day. <laughs> yeah, I'm like yikes. And he, yeah, he's just like, like hypertensive, like super. Red. And he's just he like, really was eating yeah. all those pizzas. He was. He was trying to prove that? that they were just trying to get him out of there so that they could make the quality less. It's a big yeah. conspiracy, man, so that Papa John's could stop making so they could start making more money by pulling. He's like, and I have the evidence to prove because I've eaten 37 pizzas in the last two weeks to try. I'm like, what the so, fuck are so you So he was calling his employees regular racial slurs. Mm. And now he's saying that the company kicked him out or whatever so that they could cheapen up the pizzas. Even though, I'm not seeing any mu- any much upside like, to this Papa John's place anymore. It's like, like Dog the Bounty Hunter, man. It's like they caught you saying some pretty like gnarly shit. It's like just count your losses and just move on. Like don't try to open up the conspiracy floodgates. Brian Laundry though. Brian Laundry. <laughs> He's got some dirty laundry, let me tell you. Oh. <sighs> uh, yeah. You want to do like some last plugs on uh yeah, we've been at it for a minute. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Shout out your Twitch and mm-hmm. wherever people can find your stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Grizzly Beard Man. Um, I stream on Twitch. Uh, you can follow me there at Grizzly Beard Man Live. Um, if you have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe to me for free as well um, to give me a little kickback. If you have Amazon Prime, yeah, I just give a free sub a month. So if you want to support me, um, that's a good way that you can donate but not actually have to spend any of your own money. Um, so that, um, I'm on Twitter at grizzly beard man as well. And the I is with a one, um, where else? Um, I'm, I'm in Austin, Texas, but also I post my shows, um, on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, yeah. So if I got upcoming dates, I'll post on there. Um, anytime I come back to Illinois, usually I get put on shows, um, in the Rockford area, Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison. So if you're in those areas. Come see me. Keep an eye on Netflix. It catches next special. Yeah, for, for sure. Real. You for got what sure. it takes, dude. I think you do. I appreciate least. that, guys. I yep. appreciate you very much for having me on. Uh, I love me some sh- sham show. Yeah. Yeah, um, body. Yeah, and until next time. Fucking dope, dude. Glad we caught you. For sure. Oh, man, I've had to pee for like 25 minutes. <laughs> about that? Oh. oh, did you ever see a beer in the hand of Andre the Giant? <sighs> yes. Picture. Yes. That's how I imagine you hold beers. It's, dude, it's in the palm. <laughs> I get that comment like a lot. They're just like, Jesus. Christ.